OK, so uh, today uh, we thought we'd start discussing aspects of the non-perturbative uh, connection with the scattering story. Uh, and what I've done is uh, drawn a proposed phase diagram. It, actually, let me first say I'm going to uh, give sort of a very broad brush overview of some of the uh, aspects of this story, and then we can get into finer detail as uh, desired, but, but I'm aiming for broad brush at the start. Uh, so this is a uh, proposed phase diagram as a function of, uh, say, impact parameter or basically equivalently the momentum transfer and center of mass scattering energy. And uh, I, I want to emphasize that, uh, and I think many of you realize this, a major facet of the problem of quantum gravity is the high energy behavior. And we're forced to confront very high energies just by Lorentz invariance, basically. That's part of the complete story of the theory. We should be able to describe scattering at arbitrarily high energies if we have a Lorentz invariant theory. <clears throat> OK, so. Uh, in particular, uh, I've indicated here some different regimes, the so-called uh, Born regime, the uh, Iconal regime, and the strong gravity or black hole regime. So if we think about, say, fixing the impact parameter and going to higher and higher energies, ultimately we confront uh, this <coughs> strong regime or we're doing something like making a black hole. And there, uh, we have to face up to some uh, very serious issues. So the first issue is that the perturbation theory appears to diverge. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. Uh, this is independent. of the story of renormalizability or uh, finiteness. It appears. And uh, we're still, uh, the best we understand of this regime uh, tells us that unitarity And uh, in fact, predictivity in this regime fails. Steve, in this ultra high energy. By perturbation theory diverging, do you mean some sum diverges? Or yes, and I'll say more about that. Is this the same as in QCD, for example, the same no. type of divergence? Nope. Um, there, well, or let's talk about QED. Would you be just okay. as happy? QED. There we have an asymptotic series. So we know that we get a better and better approximation as we go further and further for a while. And then, of course, there's some non-perturbative completion we need to really you know, define the thing. But at least we have a good approximation you know, at a pretty high loop order. Uh, in this context, uh, the series, and I'll come back to this, is basically 1 plus 1 plus 1. You know, it's not even asymptotic. It's just bad at the beginning. But isn't that what happens classically? I mean, if uh, it's related to classical behavior. Yeah. Yeah. It's related so it's to not a surprise that we can't get black holes or strong field behavior. In, in some respects, it's not a surprise. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But the perturbation theory you're talking about is the low energy expansion. Uh, it's an expansion in, say, G Newton, the coupling constant. Times some energy or something. Well, that's right. To make it dimensionless, you need some energy. But so you're we'll trying to work at energies where you will form a black hole, or conditions where you'll form a black hole. <coughs> <coughs> well, what I'm doing, it will. I haven't gotten there yet, but I have in mind, say, thinking about, you know, uh, looking at scattering as a function of energy and just increasing the energy to a regime where uh, where you are doing something like forming a black hole. Right, but yeah. Let me ask a close question again. Then, I mean, very low energies, gravity mm -hmm. is irrelevant. Is that not true according to this? Or? No, no, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Okay. I see the nature of the question. Yeah, no, it, it looks like, and people in fact use um, 
uh, sort of an effective field theory description of gravity at low energies, and it works well. As long as we're, you know, down here or perhaps even in this regime. So you're not uh, questioning that? Yeah, no, so I'm not questioning that, but I'm just saying that if, yeah, if we go into the high energy regime, then the perturbation series is just, you know, just bad. It breaks down. Just, yeah. Which, which, but that, you kind of would expect that from the fact that the coupling becomes strong. Um, or, yes and or, no. Or it's uh, in a way that you wouldn't expect. What's that? Yes. Can you characterize whether it's supposed to be a surprise as it's breaking down? Uh, well, I guess it's not a huge surprise, but on the other hand, uh, you know, a lot of the focus, well, it, yeah, it, maybe in retro, in hindsight, it should not be a surprise, but a lot of the focus on the problem of quantum gravity has been, you know, the sort of order by order expansion and not the nature of the sum. You know, we've you know, spent years, decades, in fact, you know, thinking about the problem of renormalizability, and this is a different problem. But it's still a possibility, um, uh, Steve, that, okay, whereas in the iconal limit, you know, it's an exponential series, so anybody yes. can resum. I mean, you need to resum. Yeah, there I is mean, a question resum of resum. And converges. Maybe yeah. as you go towards the uh, collapse regime, uh, yeah. You know, you have to do some analytic continuation of a divergent okay, theory. Yeah. And, and there is, by the, there is a question. It's, it is, there is some non-triviality to this because of the question of resummation, exactly. And so, but will, can we get there in turn? <laughs> there was a, earlier on we had a. Some of us were joking that uh, instead of giving talks, you should just come up here and state your name. <laughs> <laughs> had to do and people would just start asking questions. I feel like I've barely gotten past that. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you Tom. answer some of the questions? No, I won't ask it. <laughs> I want to say, for instance, the partial wave expansion, yeah. okay, in the S channel, yeah. the sum of polynomials in T, okay. uh, which diverges when there are poles in T. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, that's an well, example of it. Okay. Of so a series which has a finite radius of convergence, but you can continue. Okay. So let's talk about the nature of that divergence. Yeah. In a bit. Okay. Because <laughs> okay. uh, well, yeah. Let's. We'll, we will come to that. Uh, but before that, the question I wanted to uh, ask, and this is part of the theme of the week, uh, is uh, whether. Somehow the amplitude magic that we're finding at the perturbative level uh, actually extends into the non-perturbative regime in some way and uh, helps us in dealing with these issues because uh, these to me seem like the more basic issues, uh, the, the more profound issues in quantum gravity. And so uh, we'd very much like to know if you know, we're discovering some precursor of, a, um, of you know, a story that could start to address them in the perturbative story. OK, so very quickly, uh, since, well, I'm ultimately interested in this regime, but to get here from uh, the Born regime, I have to cross the iconal regime. Very quickly, I'll say a few words about the iconal regime, and then Gabriella will say more about that. So here just highlights. Uh, <clears throat> so first of all, in this regime, there is a resummation. You write down an amplitude that you get basically by resumming the ladders and crossed ladders. And it looks something like the... Uh, Mandelstam S, then there's an impact parameter representation of it. So integral over the impact parameter here, I'm working in D space-time dimensions. Uh, and then the momentum transfer is Q perp dot B. And then E to the I chi minus one, where chi is the so-called iconal phase function of impact parameter and uh, center of mass energy, that goes something like G D, the d-dimensional Newton's constant, times S over B to the D minus 4. Okay, uh, so 
this is a uh, believed to be a good representation of the amplitudes uh, in this regime where uh, you have to, again, you know, sum up exchange of multiple gravitons uh, via ladders. Uh, and one thing I want to emphasize about this regime, and you know, we could say more, or Gabriella could say more. But one thing I want to emphasize it, is that uh, this amplitude is something that looks like it's independent of the, uh, of, uh, well, it's not hard. It's, it's independent of uh, large momentum transfer through a given vertex is one way of putting it. And the reason for that is uh, fairly simple. Uh, let's just look at this expression. So we have an exponential here, e to the i chi. Roughly speaking, where is that dominated? And we know uh, that you know, in some sense, the dominant term in an exponential sum is the term uh, where chi, well, the term where you have, in a power series expansion, uh, you have order of size the exponent. So that's schematically what's going on, that the sort of dominant contributions are coming from uh, n is like chi, where n is the number of rungs of the ladder. And uh, so we have a total momentum transfer, say, through this diagram, which is Q. Uh, and uh, that is shared equally among the rungs. Q goes like K times N, where K is the momentum through any given uh, rung. And then from those simple expressions, uh, N is of order chi, Q, or K is of order uh, momentum transfer over N, so over chi. You learn that k, momentum transfer through any given rung, is of order 1 over the impact parameter, which is large. And so therefore, this is uh, very small. Uh, so <clears throat> this transfer momentum is breaking up, or I, I like to call it fractionating. And that means that the momentum transfer through any vertex is quite soft. So that's the first statement. And the second statement about the iconal regime is that uh, <clears throat> it does lead to a sort of non-perturbative resummation uh, <clears throat> Namely, you know, when you end up with this exponential, you, you have summed up a a uh, series of diagrams naively, uh, you know, those diagrams at higher and higher orders, if you expand in chi, look worse and worse. But once you get to this sum, you've built up something with better properties, basically. Uh, and so this happens, again, once you reach the green boundary over there, uh, that B is less than or of order uh, 2 over D minus 4. OK, so that's uh, basically all I had planned to say about the iconal regime before I go into the strong gravity regime. Yeah. Question. I would understand this better if uh, I chi were real mm -hmm. well, and positive. I mean. Uh, well, so how different are complex exponentials from real exponentials? Is that what you're worried about? Yeah, I mean, that, that this is, I mean it's not really true, right? That e to the i chi is well approximated by taking the term in the Taylor series where n is like chi. Uh, that's sort of schematic. I, this actually is, well, it's dominated by a saddle point. Yeah, and, uh, alternative. You're talking about a saddle, saddle point, point and the sum over n in the exponential? Or? No, no. Which oh, a saddle point, point of this expression. That's a sum of n over n. That, that, is that what you were doing here? I thought you were um, saying that the n was like chi, and so. Yeah, I'm saying, I'm asking, you know, is there a sense in which you can identify the dominant terms in the expansion of the exponential? Because order by order in expanding the exponential is higher and higher ladders. Yeah, so I don't really understand that in the case. I don't really understand. Uh, but there is this alternative way. You uh, just, just forget yeah. about individual terms in the sum, just do the saddle point, the phase, the stationary this whole thing. Yeah, saddle point is precisely in that same relation. It gives the phase is of order one. I mean, that's what... No, it, it gives that the saddle is related to ah. uh, 
to the energy and to the uh, momentum transfer in, in the correct way. So, I mean, yeah. the B is large at large energies and fixed in that parameter. And the typical so momentum transfer through a leg to, is small. I, I think it relates you can, B and Q, but here yes. he's defining another thing, K, which is Q over N. Yep. So, so yes. that, that was the part that I was asking yes, about. Yes, I understand. Oh. Yeah. I think there's a, if you're careful, a sort of better way to justify this. I'm, again, being a little schematic in that, I think. But uh, that does, I think that is what happens. Yeah, no, I think it's the right. Steve, I didn't you hear the words you said, but do you want that inequality to go the other way? Which way? Um, this is supposed to be valid for B greater than C. No, uh, no, it's when you cross this line going this way, you get into this regime, then the amplitudes are. Um, oh, this is the place you, where where you need to resum. Yeah, then then you know the Born approximation is no longer good. Naively, okay. you have this order by order Sorry. expansion that doesn't look so good, but you can sum it all up. Jim, uh, as you move E up, uh, keeping B fixed when you cross the red line, does something happen? Uh, that is my next topic. <laughs> Unless there are questions on the <laughs> first topic. Quick. quick here. So, so in the, the blue region, kind of my, my physics way of thinking with that is that you know if I have the Earth scattering from the sun or something, then all the energies are the masses are large, so that I can't think of the energies being small compared to the, you know, the GM squared isn't small. Let's say. Yeah, this is, that's exactly right. This is the regime. You know, I'm thinking about scattering of high energy particles, but this is basically the same regime that we talk about when we talk about the uh, moon going around the Earth. Okay, so my question is, is more precisely for that, is that the way I now think of that is that because they're non-relativistic, it's important in that graph of the letters that those are non-relativistic propagators. So is there uh, is the thing supposed to apply in a case where I have relativistic kinematics? No, yes. Yeah, no, non-relativistic is not, I don't think, it's important. It's not important for the... It's, the, it's the, that really we're dealing with, uh, you know, sort of a weak field regime. Uh, you know, so even if we're relativistic, if we're at large enough impact parameters, uh, we're, uh, if you work in the light cone frame of the center of mass. The light um, cone frame yeah, of so the center of mass. Yeah, you, uh, you think about the direction of the center of mass momentum to define a light cone okay. frame, then it's the transverse momentum yeah. that's behaving like a non-relativist yes. particle. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Good, yeah, that's another way of saying it. And, yeah, whether we're talking about the Earth and the Moon or talking about two high-energy particles, uh, the, uh, we're exchanging you know, soft momenta between them and building up something like a classical gravitational field, just the linearized gravitational field, in fact. And in that effective theory, I have the particles and the antiparticles, so I really should be thinking of the whole relativistic thing. Uh, well, we just have gravitons in the loop, so to speak. So, you know, they're their own antiparticle. I'm not sure which antiparticle you're worried I, about. I, I'm worried about the lines that are sourcing the gravity. So is there... Uh, yeah, so these, so we have a high energy incoming particle in, in, in this uh, sort of limit, I, I think basically loops of that are not important in, in this regime where we're really working at long distance. Even though we're working at high energy, we're working at very long distance, so we have soft momentum transfers, so we're not really uh, sort of in a relevant way exciting uh, loops of you know, things like, well, I don't know, well, this. So that makes it sound like effectively you are in a non-relativistic practice regime because you're not. It's very similar to it, yeah, although it's not <coughs> technically non-relativistic. And I think it is roughly in the sense that Tom just said uh, is one way of explaining it. <coughs> okay. Further questions on iconal? Okay. So just to belabor Douglas's question again, if you put a cutoff on K at the soft scale that you identified here, you're, you're saying you would get the same answer. It wouldn't matter. Uh, yeah, actually, okay, this, this brings up, this is kind of a somewhat interesting point, and I, this was something I had reserved in case of questions. Yeah, one way of uh, thinking about this is you could put a, well, ask about how this depends on a cutoff in B at short distances. Okay. And there's something kind of interesting that happens there. Uh, and it's nicely illustrated just with a toy version of this integral. And so let's look at a toy version of this integral just to simplify. If, if I simplify it a little bit, I can actually do the integral. So dB, B squared, 
e to the i um, g over b squared. That's, that's kind of similar. This is e to the i something over b to a power, powers of b, etc. cetera. Um, so this, this is an integral. Um, and if I expand out the exponential, uh, I get worse and worse behavior as uh, b goes to 0. So I might say, well, I, I really should be putting in a cutoff here, a short distance cutoff. And, uh, and if indeed, if I expand this out um, and then do the integrals, I get some sum over uh, you know, the terms in the expansion of the exponential, some coefficients, and then higher and higher powers of the cutoff. I'm taking lambda to infinity. Or I want lambda to be large. And so th this looks just horrible. Uh, this looks just horrible, uh, this perturbative expansion of the integral. But in fact, uh, the integral can just be done. And it uh, basically turns out to be something that's g squared, the exponential integral of ig plus some subleading stuff. But the important point is it's finite as lambda goes to infinity. Does the coefficient, the power of the b in front matter? This power? Yeah, that's It matters for having an exact formula, but I don't think it matters for what I'm saying, because the relevant thing is the oscillation in the exponent. And so, um, it, so, so the sum is bad. And this, again, comes back to the story of sort of hard versus soft or UV versus IR. Uh, you know, this looks like it has bad UV behavior, but somehow you know, if you expand it order by order. But then when you look at the whole integral and what it actually gives you, that's just kind of irrelevant. You don't get big contributions from the, uh, from the UV regime. Uh, and so, uh, you know, again, this is pretty close to this. And the argument is that, you know, something similar is happening. By the way, uh, Steve, uh, yeah. you know, in the paper by Toff, by uh, Toff, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, uh, he it did that calculation in four dimensions with a this log one. instead of a power, right? Yeah. Log where? Uh, oh, this log. B yeah, yeah. B minus That's right. This becomes a log. Yeah. And you know, if you integrate down to b equals zero, you get poles, uh, uh, which, which can, you know, which cannot be trusted. I mean, they look like uh, poles in S, uh, which are on the imaginary axis and the. It's a statement that they might be connected with black holes and so on. That's, That's uh, d equals 4 only, I guess? Uh, well, or? because you see, in d equals 4, the log becomes a 1 over yeah, yeah, yeah. b squared. Yeah, yeah. And then you get a more singular behavior as well b. Yeah. So, I mean, in your model, of course, the. Yeah. This is a little bit like d equals 6. Completely harmless as small b in your model, but if you really do four dimensions and you are not careful about. The ultraviolet, you get this pose. However, yeah. you can also prove that this gives a pure phase, y you know, a pure B independent phase to the amplitude. Various things become a little more sort of marginal in four dimensions. I agree. Yeah. And yeah, so one might want to think through that case a little more carefully. Uh, yeah. There's another question, yeah. Matthew? Uh, so if we take the, uh, the chi uh, term in this sum, mm -hmm. um, it looks like it's not really dominated by that term, um, or is that wrong? So well, okay. So that's where you have to be a little bit careful. Let's yeah, the let's look at the you know the terms in this sum. And in some sense, you know, in some sense, uh, it looks like you have an expansion like this. You're doing this integral. It looks like it's dominated by the infinityth term. Right. Uh, but that's uh, what's dominating the wrong answer. So is there any sense in which this thing on the left is true, that n, n is kind? Yeah, I, again, I think when you're, you uh, ask how you get the right answer, mm -hmm. that uh, you're, you have something like domination by the term of the correct order. So, so the argument for that is that if you cut it off at your soft scale, you would get the same answer as if you didn't cut it off at that soft scale. Is that basically the argument for, it, for this? I mean, for this well, you could cut it off, in fact, at a hard <laughs> scale. Sorry, uh, you, you could cut it. Cut, you could, he's, he's arguing that it's not hard, that those legs are, as you wrote, not yeah, hard. Yeah. So I'm saying if, if you cut off all the k's at, at that not hard scale, the argument would be he gets the same answer as if he didn't cut it off. 
Uh, well, the answer is, should be that, that uh, the, what you get is independent of, uh, of what cutoff you put on the, um, on the momentum scale, as long as it's sufficiently hard. It, just like here, in the end, when lambda gets to be large, this is sort of the dominant term. It's independent of lambda. No, what I'm trying to say is so. if, if it's true that only soft k's contribute, yeah. then it wouldn't matter if you put a cutoff on the right. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I that's that what was the argument. Yeah. I, I thought that's the argument you're making with the exact answer there. Yeah. yeah. No, that, okay, good. Yeah, I, so you didn't I guess need to we're go through talking the across the purpose. The term at all. You could just. Well, yeah, I didn't, wasn't necessarily planning on stating this. This was sort of the cheap version of the argument. There's actually an argument you could make uh, about why it's independent of lambda, which has to do with the fact that the gravitons dominate. Once the gravitons dominate, then you can do n equals h supergravity. And then... <laughs> 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 Excuse me, but uh, well, there's more to it. There's a class of diagrams, the ladder diagrams, which are extremely well behaved. Yeah. They behave like phi cube theory. Yeah. Well, yeah, but you still have to explain how to sum up all the diagrams. Uh, and so that's mainly. Well, I agree the that the graviton dominates, but therefore it's, it's scalar, and that's part of the rest of the story. I agree with that. that. That's, that's a way of understanding why the the, um, the ultraviolet is dropping out. From it. Yeah, in a, another way to... In know, some sense. Because it has to do with ladder. Well, so the n equals 8 has this property that the ladders are extremely simple. Good. They're, they're basically phi cube diagrams. Good. So once you know that, then then, it, then it's pretty clear it's going to be extremely well behaved in the ultraviolet in this limit. Yeah, again, you do have to explain you know, how you're doing the sum for the scalar ladders, you know, yeah, which is kind of like what I'm saying that's here. Right. Again, that's it's fairly that's basic. Right. That's right, but that's, anyway, that's understood. A, a, a simple way to answer Eva's question is that uh, if you put a, a, a UV cutoff, I mean, uh, yeah, if you look only at, at the UV contribution, that means that the gravitons are far off there. Yeah. They have something like a mass, mm -hmm. and then they would never give in this space a power. They'll give a, an exponential drop. So it lies mm -hmm. B, that cutoff. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, maybe another, well, I, well, sort of, yeah, at small b, this is really rapidly oscillating. That's part of the story of what, how it is. Everybody agrees for maybe different reasons. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, and so I should go on because I want to leave well, Gabriella yeah. plenty of time. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. Does this work in the presence of long-range forces? Well, like gravity, this is, gravity is a long-range force, and this is, yeah, this is giving you the classical long-range, what? Yeah, yeah. yeah, this is giving you, again, basically, in one way of putting it, coming back to Cliff's question, this is how we get the uh, gravitational influence of the uh, Earth on the moon. It really is sort of doing a sub, and building up the classical field this way. Okay, so I want to come next to the strong gravity or black hole regime, which is even more interesting. So schematically, uh, you know, we were talking about summing, say, uh, this diagram plus higher ladders, but we could start to consider other diagrams. Here's a classic, classical, classic example. Uh, there's a pun there. Um, but uh, not everyone may get that. Uh, <laughs> I'll explain the, what I'm going to explain next. Uh, so first of all, uh, <clears throat> when you start looking at these diagrams relative to the latter, say this, this diagram relative to that, what's their size? And the answer is that their size is uh, roughly this, this relative to that is... Um, uh, differs by a factor of e over b to the d minus 3 squared, and that also can be rewritten uh, as basically minus t over s. Uh, and then uh, you can keep going. So why did I choose this diagram? Well, you could take any graviton tree diagram and stick it in the middle. And that's the origin of the, uh, the pun, right? That this is 
classic, classical. Uh, these are sort of classical graviton diagrams inserted uh, in between the two lines. Okay, so the first observation is this is something that diverges in the regime uh, where B becomes, or E becomes of order B to the D minus three, or high, higher E uh, than that. Um, <clears throat> basically because it is what I said, it's, it's one, well, it's something plus so, the, something of the same order plus something of the same order and so on. It's just one plus one plus one. Um, and it's just, so it's just bad there, it appears. Uh, you could ask the resummation question. We'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, this is a long distance divergence. Again, because, uh, well, it's related to the same story we were telling here. We're, we're basically talking still about the very long distance uh, behavior of the theory, say, impact parameters of order e to the 1 over d minus 3. Uh, so it's really sort of, in some sense, an infrared problem. Uh, next, you know, what does this sum give you? Well, it does something like uh, building up the uh, classical black hole geometry. <clears throat> and uh, so, you know, one could say a few more words about that. Uh, I might, but let me make a couple of other <coughs> points. Uh, Actually, a question on that. One is building up something like the classical black hole geometry. Uh, on the other hand, we know that there's various magic in these amplitudes, as Phi was just saying, for example, at the level of the ladders and also with the higher order diagrams. So you might ask if there's any sort of simpler description of how it's building up the classical black hole geometry in terms of the ma amplitude magic story. That's one point possibly of contact and probably is related to what Donald in some sense, to what Don will say tomorrow. Um, but once you've done that, once you're doing something like producing a, cl a classical black hole, and if you resum, you actually build up the classical black hole geometry, uh, we know we have a problem, because you might try to then quantize perturbations about that geometry. And then we land in to you know, a, a very serious unresolved problem, a central problem in quantum gravity, and that is the what I like to call now, because I think it fits better, the unitarity crisis. But it also goes by the name of the black hole information puzzle, problem, paradox, what have you. Uh, unitarity breaks down when you try to think about amplitudes where you have, you're sort of looking at fluctuations on top of a classical or semi-classical black hole that then evaporates. Uh, so uh, that's you know making contact with this central problem. Just a few more comments. Uh, you might hypothesize that even in this regime there is an S matrix. Uh, you know the, the theory is quantum mechanical. There is an S matrix. Uh, so that's a reasonable hypothesis, and part, one of our goals is to try to understand what the properties are of this S matrix. Uh, and you know, maybe someday we could, even with enough information, you know, guess at features of the S matrix analogous to the way that someone in the audience guessed a certain S matrix for string theory based on you know, general <laughs> properties. Okay, uh, but again, the big question here is this question of unitarization? What unitarize? What gives you a unitary S matrix? Uh, assuming that's the answer, and uh, coming back to the magic question, you know, does magic play some role at the non-perturbative level? So just, uh, so, Steve, are you going to explain some of those? I didn't. I don't see from just your pictures that that you're building black holes. And I don't, yeah. I don't actually see that unitarity is violated. OK. Um, I see you've entered strong coupling. Yes. And strong coupling, it's hard to calculate unitarity. Yep. But I don't see that it's violated. Uh, in, in some sense, what you're yeah. doing is you're expanding a unitary S matrix in climate diagrams. 
The, the reason... If you do it right, you should get a unitary answer. So one would think, and the reason that you uh, have reason to believe otherwise is because you're building up what looks like a classical black hole. And then, you know, you might try to read something like we did over here and then consider perturbations about that, and that matches onto a familiar story. So why the black hole? Um, let me just very briefly say, again, trying to be mindful of the time, uh, let me very briefly give a, an explanation of that. So uh, let me write down a similar set of diagrams. Let's suppose that we consider gravity with a classical source. And I'm going to sum up the diagrams that give me the field resulting from that source, which I'll call J. And uh, so we have a diagram that looks like that, a diagram that looks like that, you know, higher order diagrams uh, with you know, big, bigger trees with one end hanging free, basically, connected to the source J. Uh, so let's think about this series and what it gives you. Now, if J, your source, is a mass at a point, this sum was performed explicitly in 1973 by Duff, and it gives you uh, the Schwarzschild geometry. black hole. So uh, are we really talking about the same thing? And why do I say over here we've got a black hole? Well, let's think of these external lines as being uh, sources. And so J now is equal to, you know, schematically, you know, the two particles with equal and opposite momenta, center of mass energy E over 2. Uh, well, by the same token, we should be building up the classical geometry by summing up the same diagrams. It's basically doing the same it's thing. Quantum field theory in one case, in the other case, it's a classic. Those are just classical diagrams. Um, I'm, well, the sum of field theory diagrams sometimes gives classical solutions. Classical results out, but. And, and that's, you know, again, that's what happens here. Um, but, but it converges. I mean, I, I, I guess uh, Duff does it outside the uh, horizon or something like that. Right. So. You, get, you get the Schwarzschild geometry by doing this outside the horizon, and the sum diverges at the horizon. Okay. And you're saying there's no way in these diagrams to somehow restrict to outside the horizon and see a convergence series there? Uh, no, I think... I, I think you probably can do something a little bit like that, but the problem is some amplitude is going to always go into the, the other re the region inside this, the right. This is a question of the regimes. In this regime that Steve is talking about now, the other particle is inside the horizon, effectively. Well, yeah, if you take B to be small enough, then you're, just, you're going to probe that region where your expansion is bad. Yeah. So the expansion is good, you know where the icon is starting to break down. Okay, so, so the argument is this should be the same story. We could discuss whether that's true, but I think uh, it seems to me it holds water. So you should be building up the classical geometry of this collision of two high energy particles. And the classical geometry of that, the collision of two high, uh, high energy particles at some impact parameter, uh, is not known explicitly, but it's known to contain a black hole uh, because one can find a closed trap surface in that geometry, and that's something that, uh, for, well, originally at zero impact parameters was shown by Penrose, and for non-zero impact parameters was shown by myself and Doug Erdley in 2002. And it's exactly from the response to that divergent E equals I mean, that is the statement. Well, the, the, the idea is that they're connected, yeah. I mean, basically, it's the same. I mean, we haven't seen the geometry come out of this sum in this no, case because no, it's no, too but hard I mean, to do. It is precisely when E is of order B to the D minus 3 that you can construct the closed trap surface. 
Yes, that's right. Once you have small enough impact yeah, parameters, that's just right. People who yeah. may. Yeah, yeah, once you have impact parameters below e to the 1 over d minus 3, then you have a closed trap surface, ergo a black hole in the classical okay, channel. Yeah. So, and, and then once you have that, and, and here, let me not elaborate on this again to make sure that I allowed time for Gabriella. But once you have a classical black hole geometry, you could consider perturbations about that, and that matches onto the problem of black hole information or unitarization. Uh, okay. So let me just state some ex quickly some expectations about things in the regime where we make a black hole very briefly, and then I'll be done and yield the floor. Uh, so what are some expectations? <clears throat> if we are doing something like making a quantum version of a black hole, well, a black hole is, in some ways, a little bit like a resonance. A long-lived re resonance. And uh, what do we expect for black hole states? Well, there's a number of them, say, per energy interval, uh, that goes like exponential of a function of the energy times, say, R of E. That's the Schwarzschild radius of the energy uh, to get the units right. And... Uh, this is a very dense spectrum. For example, a natural expectation, although you know, there's a question mark here, is that this function S is the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy, which goes like E to the D minus 2 over D minus 3. So very, very dense spectrum. Uh, these black hole states, when you take into account Hawking radiation, have a width of order the inverse time to emit a Hawking photon, which is 1 over R of E. So they're very narrow. Uh, and finally, there's a total cross-section, at least for the black hole part of the scattering, which goes like E to the D minus 2 over D minus 3, uh, the Schwarzschild radius to the appropriate power. Uh, so these are some expectations for what comes out in this regime. And then the big question is, uh, you know, how to get a full quantum description, which you know, we expect to have these features. Uh, let me just close by noting that the growth of the cross-section suggests, since it's violating the Froissart bound, that we consider questions of analyticity carefully. Now, of course, we're in a massless theory, so technically uh, that's one of the assumptions going into the derivation of Froissart that is not valid. But still, there's a similar interplay between analyticity, unitarity, and crossing. Uh, so there's a suggestion that there's an analyticity story where, first of all, the crossing is uh, valid. Uh, at least perturbatively, you can, uh, I think, understand, even though there's no mass gap, how you could get crossing. Uh, but uh, basically related to the growth of this cross-section, and in fact related to the form of the iconal amplitude, uh, you seem to have non-polynomial behavior of the amplitude, uh, which uh, immediately raises alarm bells. But it looks like you uh, can sensibly get behavior that is nonetheless polynomially bounded in the physical regime where, say, T is real and negative, and then you continue S into the positive comp um, or into the upper half plane. And so that suggests a story where you could have some, well, have scattering, which is. Uh, well, because it's non-polynomial, or at least that, that's connected to it in some sense being non-local, that and the uh, rapid rise of the cross-section, uh, but nonetheless causal doesn't have unphysical advances. So there's, those are just a few comments uh, in, polynomial in, in what energy. Center of mass energy. Fixed T or fixed P? Uh, you can think about either, but let's think about fixed T. Fixed T. Yeah. 
let's think about fixed T. Yeah. So uh, anyway, so that's, again, trying to infer some basic properties of the hypothesized S matrix, because the more we can infer that we can convince ourselves is right, uh, the more clues we have to the ultimate structure of that S matrix. OK, so that's all I had prepared. And uh, um, maybe I can take a couple questions, but then I really should turn it over to Gabriel. Uh, can you just Gary, explain oh. the non-polynomial? Uh, yeah. At fixed T. At fixed T. Let me, well, yeah. So if you, um, there are two ways to explain it. Let me say it in words. One is if you assume, if you make what we call a black hole onsets, where you assume that there is a strong absorption once you're inside the Schwarzschild radius, so you know T of order s, uh, and then you know kind of the expected phase structure, you see pretty quickly that leads to something non-polynomial. Uh, let me not spell that out, but I could do that privately. But a second comment is if you just look. At, Never mind black holes. If you just look at the iconal amplitudes, that the saddle point approximation to that integral I gave you, in fact, that has non-polynomial behavior too. Mm. At fixed t, you can just write, you know, write down the form of the saddle point. Gary. Yeah. So I didn't quite understand. What's the connection between the classical solution for these colliding high-energy particles and all those diagrams you have on the right? Okay. So this sums up to Schwarzschild. Schwarzschild. And so the idea is if J is this, and I look at a class of diagrams that are, you know, basically where I have a field point and then I have all the other legs of the tree attached to the source, what I'm doing is building up, uh, you know, if I think of this as H mu nu, so to speak, I'm building up, I'm writing down a sum that gives me the metric that corresponds to this source, and I know the metric that corresponds to that source, at least before they collide, is a pair of Eichelberg's Excel metrics incoming. And I know that that classical metric has a closed trap surface. So the fact that the classical metric has a unique evolution doesn't help. I mean, these diagrams, in some sense, are probing the whole region with the black hole and everything afterwards. Yeah, we've <laughs> got to somehow go beyond at least this, this part of the story. This is only a part of the story, and we've got to go beyond that. OK, maybe one more, and then really. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe just a bit. And I draw the line. Yeah, so you should also be able to build up sort of time-dependent solutions. I mean, because they, they should somehow not just black holes or just a propagating, you know, like a PP wave or some something like that. Yeah, well, you but, yeah, this is time-dependent, but yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you, you have lots of such solutions. You know, just think of a PP wave, yeah. which has a just a smooth but non-analytic profile, yeah. which you're never going to build up by some. Secret by a sort of Taylor, converting Taylor series. I guess some might be hard to build up. There, there are other examples where you can build them up, and maybe this is an appropriate time to yield, because uh, in this iconal regime, you're actually building up, for example, just from the iconal sum, the eichelberg sexel metrics, which are time dependent, and are sort of a simple example of these kinds of things. Again, maybe not with the profile functions you want. But I think you're going to say something. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> I think we can reasonably go to uh, 12.30 if we don't have a mutiny. We've been doing that commonly. Uh, okay. So it's at least 40 minutes. I'm sorry it's not exactly half. There's so many. In fact, I mean, you, you already anticipated some of the things I was going to say. Um, so let me just concentrate on, on a few things um, on which I have some confidence. First of all, I wanted to correct it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so this is different, as, as you said, <laughs> than uh, 1 over q, right? Uh, 1 over q of the collision. Isn't that? Well, yeah, because of what you explained. Because of fractionation, the yeah. b doesn't get small at large q. <laughs> uh, OK. OK, but uh, I mean. Okay. So um, the first thing I wanted to know to, to do is to compare a little bit this diagram to what we know in, uh, in gauge theories to be a similar situation, say non, in non-abelian or asymptotically free gauge theories, because I think this 
could be useful for really understanding what could be perturbative or non-perturbative, and, uh, and also in view of the connection between gauge and gravity that we hear about all the time. So it seems that, nonetheless, there is some basic difference between gauge and gravity, almost in the sense that infrared and ultraviolet get swapped together. This, I think, it's also there in ADS-CFT, if I understand ADS-CFT correctly. So, a, well, I was not drawing in log, log, plot, so let, let me say, if I, if I am in a, an asymptotically free gauge series, and I plot, again, energy here, but now here, let me put really Q and not B, so um, then... By Q, you mean... The thing that squares to minus the minus t? Yes, or, that's okay. right. Okay. Where I pretend in a gauge theory, in an asymptotically free gauge theory, there is a strict connection between the hardness of the, pro of the process in terms of momentum transfer and the distance that you probe. Whereas in cavity, as we have seen, the situation is different. Now, in this case, OK, if you say this is the non-physical region, um, then uh, what do we have? We have regimes like fixed angle scattering, which are perturbative. Okay, we describe, for instance, jets, coefficients, as we heard, uh, in operational product expansion, and things like this. There is of course, a low energy regime. Okay, here the characteristic scale is the famous lambda of QCD. I mentioned it as muted scale. So here we have the non-perturbative, non-perturbative low energy. But also, if we go a fixed Q, for instance, small compared to the QCD scale, and we go to arbitrarily high energy, we end up in a non perturbative regime with high energy, which could be, for instance, regge or, I think, I don't know, the so called soft pomeron. You know, the PDS, the particle distribution function that you need together with open the product expansion in order to get really to physical quantities. And then there, are some, there is some intermediate regime in which maybe the momentum transfer grows, but not as fast as the energy. So this would be a small angle regime in which you have, <coughs> again, it's perturbative in the sense that it should be short distance, but you need to resum. You need to resum <coughs> because typically you'll find power, say, of alpha strong times some logs so this is the regime in which you have the so-called hard pomeron, uh, you know, BFKL, for those who know these things, Sudakov form factors. So there is some similarity between the phase diagram in the gauge theory <coughs> and, in, and in gravity, but you know, as we know, the simple regime, the perturbative simple regime here is small b or large q. And here, the perturbative regime is large b. And as we go to small b or high, you know, or high energy at fixed b, uh, we get into the strong coupling regime. Now, so this is just a general Productive statement, I think, is hardly controversial. Now, what I would like to go and discuss now is something which is a bit related to the low energy theorems about which we heard yesterday, uh, and which has to do with going a little bit farther, but not quite to the to the critical impact parameter at which you expect you know, black holes to form classically. And this is the regime in which instead of just having the simplest 
I would call this the leading, leading iconal, okay, leading iconal. You have to correct this chi function, which I think got erased. And as, uh, as Steve was saying, the modification of the iconal that you get from this straight and cross ladders in which the exchange gravitons do not interact with each other uh, is corrected by these three diagrams in a way, as he pointed out, which you know scales this way. Now, why are, I mean, another way to say that these are classical corrections is to note that if I stick, stick in here the Newton constant, you know, these corrections do not contain h bar. Okay, this is just the Schwarzschild radius divided by the impact parameter to the appropriate power to be identified, as he said, with minus t over s. Is also the scattering angle, or small angle, is the deflection angle in the process. Now, these higher trees just build up more and more powers of this. So, this expansion of the iconal function uh, is an expansion in the scattering, in the deflection angle of the process. When the deflection angle becomes over the one, or even worse, when you expect collapse to occur, then indeed, you know, each term is of the same order. Now you have to worry about what is the coefficient in front of each term. And uh, I am a little more optimistic than Steve. I don't see a priori why you cannot do some physics, even if there is, if the, if the series has some uh, uh, singularities. Uh, hopefully, you can continue it. So, what I would like to uh, discuss with you is some uh, some version of what Steve called fractionation, but which belongs to the S channel. Okay, what he discussed is how a big momentum transfer can be shared among many, many exchanged gravitons so that each one of them is typically soft. Now, uh, this has a, an interesting consequence for low energy Bremsstrahlung of gravitons. I would like to present some, some results on that. And the point, I think I made this remark at one of the previous talks, is that since the exchange gravitons are basically almost on shell, the soft graviton theorem, which you know take for granted the Weinberg analysis in which only the emission of the soft graviton for the external legs is relevant, um, may break down because the emission of gravitons from the exchange gravitons themselves can be, in some cases, com in competition with the emission from the external legs. OK, I remind you why the emission of the external leg is dominant for soft gravity is because this propagator will go on shell as you send the momentum to zero. However, since this is already almost on shell, if you emit a soft graviton from here, you know, instead of getting one graviton on shell, you get two gravitons on shell. So counting poles, it's about the same. So what we did recently, um, well, there are a few results which I would like to, to tell you. And then finally, I will show a graph just to show that this is not just uh, talking. OK, it's really doing <laughs> calculation and getting numbers out. So let me say that there have been a couple of papers uh, on the classical problem. And then there is a paper which I'm writing up, should come out perhaps this week on the analogous quantum problem. So the, the papers who do the classical analysis are by Andrei Gulzinov and myself. And this was from last summer, 1409. 
4555. And then there is a more recent one by Spirin and Tomaras. Basically, agree with the yeah, theory with our result, 1503, And then uh, we are preparing a paper with Marcello Ciappalloni and Sol Ferrai, and this is to appear. Now, let me give you the, the bottom line result, which is, I think, quite interesting. So if you collide our two energetic light particles at Transplankian energies, Planck, and you want to see, as a function of the frequency of the gravitational wave, so the problem is to, to compute in a massless scattering case uh, the amount of energy that gets radiated into gravitational waves. Now, you know, if you are in the classical theory, M Planck doesn't make any sense. Okay? So this you can do at any energies. However, you expect to recover the classical result at the quantum level if you produce many, many gravitons and then you know effectively you produce a gravitational waves. By the way, incidentally, I think this is where in my opinion, to, to turn immediately from the quantum problem to the classical one is dangerous because you can do so with some approximation for sufficiently large energy or sufficiently large black holes. So I think one should be a bit uh, So now this problem, to our knowledge, has not been solved. So to compute the gravitational radiation in a relativistic scattering, even if the diffraction angle theta is small, has not been solved. For instance, there is a paper by Kovacs and Thorne in 76 that says they can do it, but only if theta is less than the Lorentz factor to the, to the minus one. So it cannot go to the put a relativistic limit and fixed theta. So what we find is quite interesting, I think. We find that the characteristic frequency, uh, OK, there, there is a, a theory called DE, gravitational waves, over the omega, just to make life simple. But we actually compute the distribution in frequency and also in emission angle, you know, both azimuthal and uh, polar angle. Here, you recover what people in the game know as the ZFL, or zero frequency limit, which in fact is related to the Weinberg et al. Low, low energy theorem. So this quantity should approach, I think I have the number right, to, I mean 4D, eh? 2GS over pi. Theta square, theta is the scattering angle, log of theta to the minus one. And in fact, we reproduce that limit. In that limit, indeed, the emission from the external legs dominates. But it will not dominate the most important contribution to the energy which is radiated. So what happens is that omega, there is a characteristic uh, say, let's plot omega times the Schwarzschild radius. So there is one here, theta. And let me put here some theta to the minus 2 for later use. So what happens is that between, OK, this is basically the value when omega r is equal to theta, it means that omega is 1 over b, because theta is r over b. Okay? I'm working up to numerical fact. Then the, uh, the distribution goes like log of 1 over omega r, which you see uh, at omega r equal, equal theta gives me the, the Weinberg limit. The soft 
limit. But the distribution, unlike what was usually assumed, is not completely flat. Okay, there is this omega behavior, log omega behavior. Then it goes down like one over omega. And then, unfortunately, our approximations become unreliable around this point. We guess that from there on the behavior becomes omega to the minus 2, but we are not 100% sure. So the main observation is that, again, some kind of uh, gravitational miracle occurs in which the hardest the energy of the initial particles, the softer is the radiation because this omega will scale like 1 over, typically like 1 over r, and r is proportional to the energy. Okay? So the general idea is that, okay, the, 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 the brain strahlung is, is very soft. Um, now, the, the other point I wanted to make is that if indeed the spectrum goes eventually down like omega to the minus 2, I'm told, actually, Rusinov told me and I checked, I think he's correct, maybe people in the audience know, this would be precisely the behavior of the gravitational radiation of a black hole if you integrate over all its uh, decay. Do people agree with that? <laughs> Do people know that? If a I mean, hole that's ringing down? From yes. If you integrate out, because you see, this is an S matrix calculation. So you look about really. The Hawking decay, right? No, Hawking no. decay. Oh, oh, Hawking. Hawking not, decay. Not classical. Okay. No, no, the Hawking spectrum. You know, people usually think, okay, it's an exponential, it's a thermal, so it should be e to the minus. But if you integrate out. Yeah, yeah. The whole duration of the evaporation process, it just goes like 1 over omega squared. Well, sorry, uh, up to, of course, again, up to here. It goes like this, and then flattens. There's a similar problem. You know, if you make a black hole from some asymmetric configuration, not just collapse of a spherical mm -hmm. shell, but say colliding two high energy particles, so you make a black hole, or a say a trapped surface that's very asymmetrical, and then it's got to ring down and radiate. Mm -hmm. In, I would think that's more similar to what's well, going on here, but uh, I guess there's a question of the match, which I don't know right offhand. Okay. Okay. Th this, as I said, is the part which is least understood. Okay. Now, uh, so this was done in this, uh, with this classical analysis. I mean, I would have to spend a full hour to explain how we did it. Okay. Gabrielli, where are the H bars in your formulas? Not here. There is no single H bar in this okay. in this so then, plot. So then it can't really be the Hawking radiation result. It's, it, I think no, it's, it is. It's incredible. Yeah, I, I, I had exactly the same doubt, but when you work it out in terms of mm -hmm. of e, e d omega, not H bar omega, mm -hmm. the frequency H bar disappears. H bar disappears from yes. the Hawking. Yeah. I checked that. I mean, I, I have to look through my notes, which I have actually around. But I think, I think it, there, there's a numerology. Let me just tell you the following numerology. So Hawking radiation comes out dominantly uh, in modes uh, with wavelength of order the Schwarzschild radius. Yeah. And you emit of order the black hole energy in those modes. Yeah. And also this balding radiation, let's call it, uh, that you know when you make a classical black hole that's not symmetric, uh, you might expect that to also be emitted dominantly in modes of order, one over the size of the black hole. Uh, yeah, if I then, And, then, and yeah, it's of yeah. order, in order of one fraction of the energy. So yes. roughly speaking, it, you know, they have this, similar this, numerology. Yeah, right? these two regions contribute the same. Okay, because if you take one over omega square, let, let's do, this, this much I can do without looking at my notes, okay. So D, the omega, equal this up to 1 over the mass or the radius, okay? Now, if you integrate this over omega, okay, you get 
1 over 1 over r. So you get r, and you get something proportional to the mass of the. If you integrate between, th then it flattens, and, uh, it flattens out and becomes r. You see, dimensionally, OK, I'm using g equal 1, but no h bar. Eh? So this d, d omega, it's uh, so it would be r squared. Yeah, because you see, at 1 over r, it is r squared. So if you integrate this in this interval, you get again. So maybe this is related to what you're saying. OK, there is this piece of soft <coughs> radiation and then this piece of harder radiation. Now, if we take this picture and brutally go to theta over the 1 and, and we assume that this is correct, this is what we write in the paper. Before knowing this was the same, uh, then, then we recovered that picture. So, um, okay, now in the paper that we are preparing with Catalonia uh, and Colferrai, we do we redo all this using this this diagrams, okay? This H diagram and generalization thereof, work into first order in first non-trivial order in theta. And we certainly reproduce this whole part. And now we are working hard to try to understand whether we can go in this regime. And it's, it's quite tricky because you know you have this emission from a, from internal legs becomes soon becomes important. I think it becomes important already in this region. And it dominates completely in this region. Now, if you compute the total yield in gravitational waves, this region is dominant by a log, because d on, you get the omega over omega. And if you cut it off here, you get even a certain numerical result for how much you yield in gravitational wave. So I think there is some kind of uh, Tendency for this, for the uh, for the gravitation for the high energy gravitational scattering to lead to uh, even before you approach the collapse regime to lead to uh, a softening of the final radiation. And in my opinion, it's very similar to the T-channel fractionation that uh, Steve was talking about. It's an S-channel counterpart of that. And in 2004, I wrote a little paper, I think I was here, where I uh, pointed out that if you go to this other regime, which we didn't have, unfortunately, time to talk about, there are many interesting things related to doing all this in string theory, like tidal excitations and so on. But if you try to go into the collapse regime, staying in this stringy corner, you find that the uh, the high energy process has a tendency to produce many, many uh, close, close or open, depending on the string field that you're looking into, strings. So many, the number grows like GS, again, like two powers of the energy, so that each individual final uh, string tends to have a very low energy of order, one over E. So last thing, I will show you the the graph, if, I, if it works. Well, you can always. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. You can. Oh, very good. Yeah. So this is the this is the um, uh, in the in the vertical axis is something proportional to d e over d omega d log theta. So we integrate over the azimuthal angle of the radiation, but we keep the polar angle fixed. And you see, it's quite interesting. This uh, there is a plateau. This red region is a really numerically a plateau, uh, which has a, a an extension 
in log theta, this direction is theta, which is 1 over omega r. So the, the reason why we get this log of 1 over omega r is that for every fixed omega, we have to integrate, and basically the plateau dominates and gives this logarithmic behavior. But if you go now to r omega equal 1, which is this 0, you see that the plateau has disappeared. So if we go to higher omegas, <coughs> the cross-section starts to go down. And uh, now, stimulated by yesterday's talk, I want to compute the first derivative of the spectrum at omega equals 0 and see whether it's related to this uh, next to leading contribution, next to leading order uh, soft theorems. It looks like it wants to come out, but I, I have too little time to, to check. Because here we get a definite prediction also <coughs> for the slope at omega equals zero of the spectrum. Well, I think I'll, I'll stop here and rather answer questions if there are. We have time for some discussion, I think. Uh, and many yes, I see a few hands. The angular behavior of this this radiation, it's peaked in, in sort of the forward direction? or Not so much. Not so much? Because you see, thank you, because I forgot to even to illustrate. <coughs> there are two, I don't know, like waterfalls <laughs> in this diagram. One is a theta... In fact, a theta smaller than theta scattering. Sorry, maybe here I changed slightly notation. Theta is the emission angle of the radiation. Theta s is the scattering angle. So actually, this is the absence of collinear diversity <coughs> in gravity. Mm -hmm. okay. We believe that the, yeah, this yeah. is due yeah. to the elicity zeros, right. which kill actually. So it's not particularly collinear. On the other hand, there is a cutoff in Q, the transverse momentum of the emitted graviton, and that is 1 over B, not 1 over R. So I forgot to say, the, the nice picture which emerges is something like this. That if you have your collision, let me draw it like uh, Eva, I think, was drawing it, uh, and the car is fast. Something like this, okay, where this is the deflection angle, theta s. <coughs> the, the radiation seems to be contained in a momentum space in a cylinder whose transverse size is 1 over b and whose longitudinal size is roughly 1 over r. So this is, we're in the center of mass frame. Yes, yes, the center of mass frame. So this doesn't look like Hawking radiation, which is mostly S. Yeah, uh, which is more isotropic. But as you go to B <laughs> equal R, ah. you see, a small see. angle is still right. very much like this. But Great. if we extrapolate to theta more than one, then besides in that region, it may look like. But again, so bald, it balding that, radiation may have the same kind of properties. I think there were a few more questions. I don't know, either or. So, a while ago, privately, you mentioned a connection between this and Reggie like behavior, but with G Newton replacing the alpha prime. Is, is that related to the softening you're talking about here? Um, this log that you. Oh, the log. The, this log is related to that. Oh, you mean the soft? <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. Well, maybe I can tell you that little story for those who don't, who don't know it. Uh, if you take Weinberg's paper, 60, 65 paper on the soft limit, and you look at uh, how what is the function which exponentiates, for instance, when you when you sum many gravitons, you get some log. Of the, of, you know, the exponential some log of the uh, of the infrared cutoff, and then there is a function b of the momentum. This function uh, 
this function turns out to be s log s g newton times s log s plus c log p plus u log u. Maybe there are some signs here and there <laughs> <laughs> to make it to make it real uh, in the physical region. But if you go to small angle, since s plus t plus u equals zero you can rescale the logs by an arbitrary factor. So let's decide we we'll rescale it by s. <coughs> we kill this term. This becomes u over s, which is of order 1, if we are at small angle. So the main contribution is this t log t over s. But t over s is theta square. So this g t log theta square, uh, maybe we should get rid of the picture. <laughs> is related precisely to the, and the, 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 the amusing thing which I think Eva was alluding to is that the beta function, you know, the, the four point function for both open and closed strings behaves at fixed angle precisely like this with alpha prime replacing uh, G Newton. <laughs> Now, I was discussing this with David Gross. Is he here? No. Uh, and he was telling me that probably this is the only function which satisfies <laughs> all the possible problems. So what else can it be? <laughs> the yeah. But of yeah. course, I mean, this, this is true in any dimension in, uh, in string theory, whereas you know, it's only in four dimensions that you have this infrared uh, thing. But so it's, it's not string. You find it here. In a way that's clearly not stringy. No, 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 no. I find it really. Uh, I mean, you see, so this point, you know, this s theta square is t, and this g t log theta is this g t log theta I had a moment ago. Okay, so g t log theta. So uh, we were very happy to find that the, the zero frequency limit is reproduced. But we have a finite slope here, actually. I, mean, I, I didn't draw it well. This slope gives a finite slope. So it'd be very interesting to see whether that slope is related to the next to leading correction to the soft graviton, which involves the angular momentum. And a back of the envelope calculation seems to show that indeed that angular momentum gets divided by an energy with this the impact parameter. And this is what we have. As a slope. So, but it's still a back of the envelope calculation, so don't take it. Uh, right. I missed something uh, early on. Why did you expect this to work at energies large compared to the pump? Well, because yeah. if you compute now the, the I think it's again a very similar argument to the fractionation argument. The number of exchanges go like G S, maybe times some powers of B. Unless this number is very large, you cannot expect to find classical behavior. Uh, I mean, here we are talking about gravitational waves, not about gravity. Uh, I mean, here we are talking about gravitons. Here we are talking about gravitational waves, and you know how you. We go from one to the other. I think, in my opinion, it's only a Transplankian energy that you can. The, the, there's a cheaper, well, a simpler answer, but I think it drives at the truth. Earth moon scattering is ultra Planckian scattering. <laughs> but still. <laughs> right? It's, you know, the, yeah, yeah, of course. The Planck mass is 10 to the minus very, 5 grams. Yeah, very high energy sources. If, you know, the rest mass of the Earth is pretty big in Planckian. Yeah, but I thought, yeah. well, so, so I mean, if you have a low energy like collision, yeah. subplank and energy collision, I don't think, I think this is what you, born, uh, I think you got quant quantum. I mean, I don't think you can get this class. Or you cannot get a single hard graviton emission classically. Like you cannot get a single photon in QED. I don't think there's a classical analog of the hard photon emitted in the class C minus collision. Hard. Hard. 
but there will be an analog of Brems Stalung in terms of classical radiation. I mean, maybe an analogy that might be helpful here is that uh, a long time ago, before we even had any clue to what the theory of the strong interactions was, Steve Weinberg wrote this paper about summing soft pions, yes. where he used the, the pion low energy theorems to tell you what the distribution of soft pions in a high energy scattering would be just based on current algebra. And it effectively reduces to solving the classical nonlinear chiral Lagrangian equations of motion. So you get like a classical field. And you get a classical field of pions. It's, but it's you need very... these many, many quanta. Exactly, exactly. So the idea was that in the massless pion limit at high energy, you'd be emitting a lot of pions from every scattering amplitude. And you could sum that up using the soft pion theorem. And, and that reduced to the classical. But that yeah. would be something like a coherent state. If you got a classical yeah. field. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't see that. Here. No, no, I didn't explain at all uh, the calculation with Chapaloni, which is the quantum calculation. The other calculation is classical. There you can go to any energy, you can go to an MEV. <laughs> <laughs> you get a little so the, the bit unpublished of, paper of is the justification of that based on actual quantum calculations. The paper that will come out hopefully this week will be the quantum calculation which matches the classical. Um, uh, this result for the number of strings produced, which is a GS, is that in four dimensions? Uh, GS, it sounds, uh, yeah. this one? Yeah. No, it's in, in any number of and dimensions, dimensions, but as, uh, it's, it's very similar to uh, what Steve had. Okay, there will be, because this is a pure number with h bar equal 1 only in 4D, there, there will be some other parameter. <coughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. I don't know if there is any other... Else? Maybe I should mention just one thing, uh, just since it intrigues me and maybe somebody has some light on it. There is this paper by Dvali, Gomez, Tiberger, and uh, somebody else, which looks vaguely related to this idea, but which I find very hard to believe. <laughs> so if anybody has. And this is the calculation. They pretend to have computed by string techniques, field theory techniques, scattering equations, what have you, the process E much bigger than M Planck that goes to quanta to N quanta, N gravitons, they say, where they take N to be of order the entropy of a black hole, so order E squared. So each graviton would carry an energy one over E, and so on. Or rather, they study this as a function of N, and they claim that the preferred value would be precisely the one corresponding to the entropy, and that even a three-level calculation gives already a very sensible answer. This I find very hard to believe. <laughs> one question on that, are they, I guess this is on other people's work, but are they really approaching the, um, impact parameter regimes that sub Schwarzschild or not? Because if I you're asked that question. Yeah. I asked that question and the answer was, we don't project into any particular impact parameter. Oh. So we sum over impact parameters because yeah. there. And yeah. therefore, since we know that large impact parameter would not give this final state, we guess that Oh. It comes from small impact parameters. But the regime just above, that's bigger than the Schwarzschild radius, but close to it, I think, can give similar characteristics yeah. too. It's like this Baldwin story. Yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah. So that would be. Uh, I, I, I suggested them to, to try to, to work at fixed impact parameters, but they have not done it. So, yeah. Are there uh, comments or questions? Okay, thank you very much.